today I'm going to demonstrate and talk to you about component tolerance effects on tone stacks. Resistors, capacitors. If you need to pay more for a resistor or a capacitor, what is it worth the extra money? And how, but you don't know until you see the effect on the tone stack. So I've taken my software, and since I used to also do risk analysis when I was working and also teach risk analysis, I thought, what better thing to do other than take risk analysis and put it into my tone stack design so I can look at, uh, you know, tolerance variation on the tone stack de design and decide, make an educated uh, determination of whether it's worth paying extra for an upgrade in component pricing. With resistors, it's fairly common. You can go out on the internet and find 1%, 5%, 10% really easy. You can pay more for a half percent. You can get them in carbon and metal film and metal oxide uh, construction. But it's the tolerance that's going to make a difference on the tone stack uh, response curve that you see on screen. Capacitors are another matter. Typically, you're going to find 10% or 20% because you're not a large manufacturer or some computer they actually go to a capacitor manufacturer and say look I need the following specifications the capacitor I need a hundred thousand component run or a million component run and I need a lock-in price you're not going to get that what you're going to get is things that you can find online 10% or 20% that's about it Way back when, when they started making capacitors looking like this, they color-coded them. Resistors and capacitors looked pretty much like you see on screen here. They both looked the same. The only way you could tell the difference between a resistor and a capacitor was the number of bands. That's the first tip-off. And then when you measured across it, if you weren't measuring resistance, it was a capacitor. Otherwise, they pretty much looked the same. So they color coded. The color codes for a capacitor and a resistor are the same back when they were manufacturing these. And this is a 50 picofarad capacitor and it's, uh, it operates at several thousand volts. Yeah, it is a, it's a red brick. They don't do that anymore. But look on screen. You normally find these in values of 5% to 20% you won't find half percent. They eventually got to there when they went to ceramic capacitors. Then you can get down to 1%, 2%, 2.5%. Nowadays, they don't color code. They have numeric, alphanumeric coding. So if you see a K at the end, so at the, on this, it will be stenciled the value, and one of those values might be the letter K. And if you see the letter K, it means it's plus or minus 10%. On this one, which is rated for a thousand volts, this one has a designation of Z, minus 20 plus 80 percent. I hook it up and take a look at it. This thing is close to 0.1 microfarad. I'm good. But if it drifts off from that, it could be that the Z means I picked one that was within tolerance, but it's not what I need for my design. The same thing applies to this. This is a ceramic disc capacitor. Notice how much smaller it is. This is only good for like 100 volts. But this will say the same thing. On the, the marking, on the jacket, you'll find a voltage rating, which typically you'll see in this size, not this size. And the next one down, on both of them will say 104. That means it's a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. And K, on what you see on screen there, means plus or minus 10%. Let's take a let's look at the demonstration of what that means. Move that off the side. Here's my software that's on screen. This is a big muff. Now then when I as I've shown you in other videos, I build the sub uh, filters up and then calculate the total response curve. I don't use matrix math, Kramer's rule, transforms or the like. So here it is, uh, a big muff, two resistors, two capacitors. This resistor here is simply the tilt control, as I've shown in that video before. 
So let me reset. I'm going to turn off the sub assemblies so we can focus on the total response curve. Notice the big muff is actually pretty well scooped here at uh, what is this 500 hertz. I'm going to turn on another line and I'll show you that so you can see what's going on. This is the zero uh, knob position or mid knob position. And then this is the same frequency by reduced volume. So I'm going to bring it up. The reason I do that is for the tolerance. Doing risk analysis for a living, I still teach this on the side. I thought, why not do risk analysis with real data this time for a tone stack design? So I'm going to risk this one. So if your resistors are 10% uh, plus or minus and capacitors are plus or minus 20%, this is what you thought you designed. But as you put components in, this one's close. You might not hear the difference because it's not as scoop, it's not scooped as much. And then this one sounds a little different. It is now uh, the center frequency is uh, closer to 450, not 520, and it sounds uh, scooped at mid band. You're going, well, I like that. Well, now you can come down here and go, well, uh, C3 is 12% over. And C1 is nearly right on spot. It's 1% it's over. Maybe I want those values to get that sound effect at mid uh, control. As I go through this, you can see it's now gets really scooped. Uh, C1 is 12% under. C3 is 14% under. It's heavily scooped. So when you're listening to this, the mid frequencies, if you're a... Uh, a bass player you're gonna like this all oh, the bass sounds good and you're not playing treble so the bass is sounding good but if you're a guitar player it's sounding not as bright it sounds dark and as you go through the risk analysis on this you'll start seeing that it also can get uh, fairly bright well, let's see oh I don't have a way to back up the software just let me find a stopping point there. This one may sound fairly flat across the uh, frequency range. And if you're a guitar player, you may like that. It still operates the same. I mean, you can uh, get your bass and treble mix uh, back and forth. That's fine. It's just not as scooped. What that means is <clears throat> C1 is 15% up. C3 is 20% down. And the resistors within you know, 3%, no big deal. Let's put resistors to zero. It says that the value of the resistor is the value of the resistor. It's going to be perfect. Let's reset. Uh, so as I go through this, let me reset this. Turn this off. Take an image. 20% of the capacitor, I'm going to vary that around. You can see as I vary the capacitor, that tone stack is moving all around. Let's put the capacitor at zero and the resistor at 10% and do this again. The resistor plus or minus 10% is not changing the tone stack quite at all very much. It pretty much honors what you designed. But getting the capacitor a little off is a problem. So when I build a, tone, uh, build a tube amp, let's say I'm building a Premier 28 for somebody, it's about $800 in parts and about $800 of labor. The first 40 hours is building the chassis and putting it together the first time. But then it takes me somewhere around 15 to 20 hours working with the tone stack because I have to buy dozens of these. I buy dozens of these. I try to get the plus or minus 10% values but in, even in doing that, I can measure them with my fluke meter, and it says, oh, okay, it's point, you know, one microfarad. But there's only so much you can do with, you know, a digital ohm meter at the house. I don't have lab equipment, so I have two choices. I either got to put a circuit on, breadboard a circuit, go to an oscilloscope frequency sweep generator, and take a look at it, and start trading out resist uh, capacitors until I find what I want on screen, 
or I have to sort of say I know these are close and I solder and desolder capacitors and keep changing out until it gives me what I designed but also sounds like what I anticipate it to sound like. So you spent $1,600 on a Premier Twin 8 amp and it doesn't sound like it. Why? Because you've, you've taken $20 worth of parts in your tone stack and you didn't care. What you need to care about is the capacitor. You need to take, buy a bunch of those, don't, don't cheap out here, buy the 10 percents and you still have to go through a trial and error to get what you need on screen. But that's what I've done with the software here. So it's the capacitor that makes the biggest difference. Uh, the capacitor and resistor, uh, again, at 10 percent, 20 percent, it is still changing a lot, but it's the capacitor that's at fault. Let's go look at the Fender Tone Stack. We're going to do the same thing. Let me redo the scale on my software. Um, everything's turned off here. Take an image. So as I 10% resistors, 20% on capacitors, as I go through that, it's changing quite a bit. So which is it, the resistor or the capacitor? Well, let's go back 20% on the tolerance of the, the uh, capacitor, which means it's spot on. And we're going to vary the resistor by 10%. So as I vary that resistor, and they're all varying a little bit here and there, it pretty much stays as you've designed it. That's good news. Let's say that the resistors are perfect. Capacitors are at 20%. You just pick one and you're just, you know, you got three and it makes a difference. So now you can see the difference the capacitors are making. It really moves it off the design. Not terribly, but some. And just that, what you see on screen, means when you're hand wiring or you're building a tube amp uh, using turret boards and lugs or point-to-point -point hand wiring, the other problem with a capacitor is I tell people this much capacitance to my index finger my thumb this is about 40 nanofarads. Look at on screen. C2, the mid, the capacitor on the mid control is 47 nanofarads. This is 40 nanofarads, plus or minus 20%. I don't have a color code on there, but that's what that is. The reason I, that makes a difference is the lead length on the capacitor interferes with the total capacitance value of the capacitor. And how much of that lead you solder to the terminal lug or the turret board uh, lug, that contact area is adding capacitance. It's adding somewhere around 5 to 10 picofarads or nanofarads. And all of a sudden, you've increased this uh, considerably, 10%. Uh, well within the capacitor. So you can actually buy 10% capacitors and because the way you've installed them that uh, soldering joint plus the plus or minus 10% of the capacitor is now a 20, plus or minus 20% connection. That's the reason it takes a while to fine tune a, t a tube uh, amps tone stack. So as I go through this it's the capacitor. What if I get 10%? A 10% is not so bad. It's hanging in there. But like I said, the, the lead length, the lead contact length on the lug, the, uh, the quality of the solder joint itself can add another 10 nanofarads to this. And all of a sudden you're in the plus or minus 20% range. So while I'm looking at my design work, I think I want to look at the 10% capacitors on a fender because it can make a big difference. But still, looking at this, it's okay, but it's going to sound different than the one the tube amp your friend made. Two identical amps, hand wiring. While everyone strives to have a hand-wired tube amp, understand the tone, the tone stack is going to have the largest effect on the tube amp uh, quality of sound. And that's going to make a big difference on why it sounds different. 
you don't have this problem with circuit boards and manufacturers because uh, when they put in a, a, a component lead into a printed circuit board, the component lead is very tiny. The solder joint is extremely tiny. It's consistent from solder joint to solder joint. And this wraps up why a tolerance of a capacitor makes the biggest difference to a tone stack. The resistor, not so much. Take the time to buy capacitors that are at least plus or minus 10%. Stay away from the 20s. It's not a showstopper, but it will make your tube tone stack sound different than your friends. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for watching.